How's it going, everybody? And thank you so much for tuning in for another author chat. So today I'm excited to have author Richard Swan joining me, author of the upcoming fantasy debut, The Justice of Kings. But Richard, uh, how are you doing today? Hello. Yes, I'm very well, thank you. It's uh, going to be a hot day here in Sydney, where I live, but uh, where I'm not from. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got a day of writing ahead of me after this call, so I'm feeling like I'm in a quite a good mood. How about you? Not, not too bad. Like I said, uh, I was telling you before we got on, you know, we're expecting some really bad storms in Alabama <laughs> today, which I feel like I say that like every other week when I do one of these. <laughs> so you just never know what it's going to be. It's either your really bad thunderstorms, tornadoes, the power's going to go out, who knows. So good God. But you know, it, it's been it's been an interesting week already because uh, yesterday I realized that um, my refrigerator just like decided to stop working just Perfect. just to stop you know making things yeah, cold yeah, yeah. like it's supposed to yeah that's know. right the um, gas exchange yeah yeah so I, <laughs> I had an appliance <laughs> guy come out today and he said well if if, if we're gonna fix it it's gonna be sixteen hundred dollars. Surely not. My fridge is twenty seven hundred dollars, which is it's expensive. Like, but it's like a really big fridge. Like, it's, I was going to say that's actually extremely expensive. Yeah, it's like you know, French store, you know, four hundred dollars freezer. Yeah, um, <laughs> but I'm like sixteen hundred dollars is like yeah, it's like it's steep. <laughs> there it is. It's really steep. Um, uh. But he was like, you know, call LG, see what they can do. Well, they're going to come out and fix it for free next week because they still have a warranty on it. <laughs> oh, of course. It's so quite, I'm like, oh, nice. Oh, oh, cool. So. <laughs> Sixteen hundred dollars free, you know. Cut, Versus cut, cut zero dollars. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. It's so not much of a choice. Literally, I've literally got a makeshift <laughs> makeshift deal out my garage. I bought a chest freezer because we we have a bought a bunch of power outages in our neighborhood. Um, mm. but I uh, I went and got a mini fridge last night so we could kind of store some stuff. Get and the then busy. my uh, yeah, and then my dad goes, "Well, I've got your mini fridge from college. I could bring that over." So literally, we've just got this. This ghetto rigged, like two, <laughs> two stacks, like stacks mini on fridge. top of each other. Yeah, amazing. And just it's, like floor to ceiling with beer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's it's just and, uh, and man, it's butter. something else. And I'm just expecting the power to go out now, so I'll have to pull the old generator out. You know, it's, they'll probably just fall over or something and smash. Probably, the front. yeah. I literally look out there, the wind like caves in my garage door. That's it's, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious before we kind of get into your life. So what? What, uh, I guess, got you over to Sydney from the UK? Um, my wife. Um, okay. My wife is, uh, is she's, is, I say she's Australian, she's sort of half Australian. Her, her dad is Australian. So, um, you know, it's something that's, it was on the cards for a long time. You know, we met each other seven or eight years ago. Um, and I think it was something that she always wanted to come, come back to because she'd lived here before. So we moved in October last year, having lived here for a year before that. And then we went back to London for a year during the Great Plague. Um, so uh, yeah, we moved back now. So yeah, is it just really just a matter of you know coming over here and kind of living here for a few years and and uh, you know enjoying the many delights of the country and in you know, a nice weather and then probably head back to the UK after that. Um, so it's yeah, there's no rainy and grey all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I I it's something like sixty percent overcast in the UK um, at, on an annual basis. So right. it's. It's not even like I don't mind. I'm one of these people. I don't mind the rain if it, you know. I don't mind interesting weather if it's going to do something cool, like a huge thunderstorm or something. I think that's great. Uh -huh. I just hate in the UK. It's just it's constantly overcast. There's, there's no interesting weather. It's just it's not. It's even rain. Sometimes you get like a drizzle. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But otherwise, it's not even raining. It's just grey, and it's like do something. You know, the weather needs to just do something. Yeah, it's more it's more like an annoying thing. Like, you know, yeah. you, you're driving around like, OK, if it's, is it going to decide if it's going to rain or not? Like you kind of turned your windshield wipers on, but like it's not enough to where it really no. does anything. <laughs> exactly. And it, uh, they just kind of squeak, don't they, when they're getting kind of dry. Yeah. I hate that. They squeak. The, you know, the, yeah. the, the silicone <laughs> comes off. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. So so, I'm I'm asking, so did you have to like get out of the UK to kind of write in that in that dreary gray kind of sense? Because I mean, that, Justice <laughs> of Kings does have a kind of like a, a UK gray feel. <laughs> It does. It's interesting you say that because um, I actually wrote, so the, the, the novel started life as a short story, which I wrote in um, a place called Exmoor, which is um, in the southwest of the country. And it's a, it was a bleak sort of February weekend and it was like cold and it was a bit drizzly and it was grey and, you know, it's, it's the moors, like, it can be very beautiful, but they can also be quite desolate. Um, and that obviously really kind of bled through into what was what was then, as I say, short story, which is now the first 
chapter or two of the Justice of Kings, The Witch of Rill. Um, and so, yeah, I did really kind of hold on to that unpleasant, cold, dreary kind of weather. It's it's kind of the whole book is shot. Sova is much nicer. Like, but in in book two, Sova is much sunnier. Um, and this sort of like it's quite funny actually that I've written the majority of book two when I've been here. Um, and it's a sunny place. So maybe I am being affected by the weather in ways that I didn't really realize. And so we get into book two and it's like everybody's much happier, like nobody dies, you know. <laughs> Really uplifting. It's like Rich, Richard needs to yeah. go back to the UK. Like this book's yeah. getting way yeah. too happy. The just complete tone shift. Yeah, very. Like, just imagine your editors go as like, what? Happens? I don't know what to do with this. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. No, it is. It is. It's, it's supposed to be. I mean, Sova is geographically much further south than you know most of the events of the first book. So, mm. it's it is sort of it's supposed to be a kind of, you know, if if book one was largely set in a kind of analog of you know england or like northern europe then you know sober would be kind of southern italy you know rome and that mid middle of southern so it's kind of you know geographically it's further south so it is warmer and it's supposed to be this kind of like you know huge kind of liberal melting pot of, of cultures and things so Sova is a very different place and it's deliberately so so you know if you read book one and you think well this is a kind of horrible dreary very patriarchal quite bigoted society uh, yeah, that's very deliberate, um, yeah. you know, because it's it's all supposed to be uh, building up to the big distinction that we draw between, you know, the hinterlands and then, you know, the capital of the empire. I got gotcha. you. So uh, go and kind of rewind it back a little bit. So tell me, tell me about yourself. You know, uh, did you mm -hmm. did you read a lot growing up? Who were a lot of your, you know, maybe your your influential people that you read growing up that kind of got you into writing? And then when did you start writing seriously? Sure. So I, uh, I mean, I think the, the first sort of genre, book of genre fiction I wrote, uh, read was Space. I don't know if you've heard of this, Space Trap by Monica Hughes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's basic. Uh, it's an old book now. I think Monica Hughes is a Canadian author, but um, I picked it up from a public library when I was about seven or eight. And it's this fantastic novel. It's about these children who get, they kind of, it's a science fiction novel, but they, um, they end up finding some kind of thing that teleports them to another planet and they get kept in a zoo um by these aliens and then they kind of escape and it's about them escaping um very very cool and so i sort of read that and then i read you you know you sort of the usual i don't know the hobbit and other kind of more you know kids books and then i read a lot of like disc world in my teens and i read a book called the ring of five dragons by eric van lisbada which is a series i don't think it's really kind of fallen off the radar it was one of those kind of mid 90s you know fantasy series um I think he then went on to write The Born Identity, funnily enough. And so he kind of like completely abandoned his fantasy writing career and just <laughs> you know, followed the money, which is absolutely fair enough. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, th I think it's the same guy. And um, but that was like one of these. And I read it. It was it was obviously a book for adults. And I was only about 13 or 14 when I read it. And I, was, and I just I couldn't so much. of it, I just couldn't follow because you know if you're reading like a secondary world fantasy but you know nothing about secondary world fantasies mm -hmm. you're, you're being kind of bombarded with concepts and things that are completely alien and it the story was about a, a, an alien invasion of a fantasy society and how they then co subsequently coexisted it was very i mean it was brilliantly done yeah um but it was i don't i'm not sure but anyway but um he he <laughs> <laughs> sorry i'm gonna go otherwise i'm gonna go down a rabbit hole but you're good he, he, <laughs> and I read that on holiday once and we were on holiday in France and I read that and it just blew my mind and I was like wow and I so you know I was at the time as well big influences for me like before you know before I really started writing were like mostly computer games so there were things like Halo, Starcraft, um, you know well, Tiberian Sun, you know the Command and Conquer series all these kind of uh, Halo, you know, the Halo series, Halo 2 so all these kind of things started feeding into my and then like things like, you know, the Star Wars prequels, obviously that when I was growing up, they were like coming out. So, you know, the Phantom Menace and especially the Attack of the Clones, you know, they were, these are like huge. I read a lot of sci-fi when I was younger. I've, I've written almost exclusively sci-fi until Justice of Kings. So I, I first kind of got into writing when I was about, I want to say 12 or 13 and I was, you know, just at school. And one day I decided, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm going to write, a, I'm going to feel like I'm writing a story. I'm just going to do it. And, uh, and I wrote what I, you know, in my head was a sort of a novel at the time which was probably about 7,000 words. Mm. Um, but, if it, you know, but it took me a long time to write it, so it felt like a novel. And then I turned that into a trilogy of novels. And it's actually an inadvertently hilarious sequence of novels because um, it's supposed to be about this, this special, for this sci-fi special forces group 
and they go down to Earth, and Earth has been abandoned, right? And this is kind of a rebellion on Earth, and they go down to Earth, and they get stuck into this battle, and and anyway, but obviously this this is like a, this was like a kind of like a, a teenager, like a young teenager writing it, so there was no actual kind of thought given to sort of special forces tactics and how they would actually operate yeah. and things, yeah, because you, you don't know, right? And so yeah. all you know is you know what you've seen in media, and so these guys, you know, I remember very vividly, they were like in the forest, in this jungle. And they were like thousands of enemies kind of chasing them, sending on them, and they were kind of running away. And then all of them just like, right, well, it's, you know, it's kind of like bedtime now. So they all, all three of them just go to sleep. And I was just like reading it back. I was like, this is terrible. Like they would all just be killed. Yeah. No, the, <laughs> you know, the enemy forces, they decided to halt what were they were too. They all, they all took a snooze. Give them five minutes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, <laughs> you know, and it was this, it was a very kind of child, childish you know, way of writing it was very kind of you know naive and but I wrote you know I wrote it and then I wrote another novel with a friend and and that was more of a kind of proper novel length and then I really it wasn't until I was about 17 or 18 that I wrote what would become basically the, the kind of the blueprint for every novel I've written since and that was another sci-fi one but it was like it was so um, instrumental in like how I approach the, the process of novel writing like how I plan the kind of the lengths of novel I go for you know the chapter lengths and structure the kind of your classic th- and so I you know I wrote this book again another sci-fi it was a multiple third person point of view sci-fi you know book um, and it was called Mindscape um, and uh, I still got it somewhere and it, it it just as I say that was the the big kind of the sea change happened after that point and then I there was used to be um, you know, Black Library, the, the Warhammer 40,000 fiction publishing arm. So they used to have forums on the internet, on the, on the internet, um, back uh, years ago. Like years ago. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, the <laughs> World Wide Web, as it was known back then. Um, and uh, they used to have these forums, which no one really has forums anymore, but they had these. And one of the, um, the things on the forums was a fan fiction forum. And, you know, they used to just encourage and, like, moderate, like you know, proper kind of and some stuff on there was like fantastic and I wrote so basically from when I left school to the end of un- my university years so sort of 2010 I must have written about five or six kind of novel length pieces on that forum and l- looking back on it now I guess it was kind of like a workshop because people would you know give feedback they would say what they liked, what they didn't like you know and everything from like picking up typos and grammatical errors to like proper kind of in-depth you know feedback and it was a fantastic community um and so you know that was you know if you're thinking about when you first start writing and it's all it's a numbers game you've just got to get the words down on on paper it was a brilliant exercise in that um you know and it just absolutely turbocharged my you know my my creativity and like my writing education if you like and and so it was after that kind of and then it closed the forums and so that kind of died a death and so I kind of and then, and then I was kind of started, you know, working in the corporate world and I had a bit less time. Um, and so it wasn't, I sort of took a few years off and then I came back to, to writing after that. And then that's, you know, as you know, that's when I started sort of self-publishing a few things. Um, so that's when I did my, my sci- science fiction self-published trilogy. Um, and that did quite well, you know, that, that did okay. And, and the, the, the difficulty I think that a lot of people have with self-publishing and certainly I had was the marketing side of it. So you know, at Orbit, there's a literally several people whose only job it is, is to, to market my books until I leave them to it. Um, but obviously, with self-publishing, you have to do all, do all entirely yourself. And I just didn't have the time or the patience, you know, for it really. Like I, I, I mean, in, in essence, I just could, couldn't be bothered. Um, and I thought, oh, my writing will stand on its own merits. And I just kind of like, you know, people will I'm... just come to find me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not. It's not like this marketplace is absolutely saturated with you know, thousands of self-published novels. Um, no, there's only like five a year, and so yeah, I always yeah. will stand up on top. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, though, like, it wasn't that mature. KDP, you know, the, the Kindle, you know, self-published Kindle apparatus Mm -hmm. it wasn't that new it was quite new still then it was because this was about 2015 i would i would say it was only like five or six years old at that point Mm -hmm. and so you know some guys you know who got in on the ground floor were doing quite well out of it you know you know independent publishers they kind of made a bit of a name for themselves and um you know i i did it all anyway the books did ended up doing quite well it was was you know there's 10,000 copies or something it was 15,000 copies in total for across the whole 
which is which is great across the whole. Yeah. And I did like the trilogy. I did like a, a prequel. I did a couple of you know, spin-off novellas and things. So that was all. That was great. And I, I, I'm still like you know very happy with that. I did go back because I thought, oh, if I'm going to be properly published now, people might start digging through this this back library. So I better just make sure it's actually okay. I might um, have. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I may have bought the entire trilogy. Just, yeah, I, I, I know that. you say it. No, no, but, no, but that's good. And but the thing is, though, and thank you by the way. And the thing yeah. is, I probably have a bigger margin on those books than I do on uh, the Justice of Kings. But um, the um, the thing with those, I went back to them, um, and uh, I was like, you know what, I, they could probably do with a bit of tweaking. And so I did like edit the first chapter of the first book because it was a bit convoluted. Mm. And then I kind of went through it, and I was like, you know what these are actually okay like I don't think I would really change anything about them like the, the right the narrative is not that far away from like my current writing style like it wasn't it didn't need to be edited like it, the you energy didn't take time... a red pen to it <laughs> no I didn't I did I did, yeah. I did I didn't and I was surprised at that I thought I was going to tell them to shreds and I and I was like you know what I'm actually still ha I wouldn't ri if I was to sit down and write the same novels again I don't think they would be much different Mm -hmm. um and so i kind of hit i i think i'm a, kind of hit my stride as a writer at that point in time um and so i was still happy i didn't change them i took out some sex scenes i was like these could these can go like these the, <laughs> these are <laughs> these are a bit gratuitous they're not really advancing the plot in any way i'm just going to delete those right. um but otherwise i kind of left them I left them as they were um so that happened and then then i did another book called earth remembers which was a I'm a big fan of Dan Abnett. He writes, he does a lot of Black Library stuff, but he did um, Gaunt's Ghosts, which is a long running series about um, a regiment of infantry in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's excellent. I recommend it to everybody. Um, it's kind of like, people say it's kind of like you know, Sharp, the Sharp novels, Richard Sharp, mm -hmm. the kind of yeah. Napoleonic. It's like Sharp in space, but it's people kind of the shorthand for that series. And that, that's accurate. Um, and I thought, I want to do my own Gaunt's Ghost. So I'm going to set, and I, I wanted to do some kind of diesel punk, kind of World War II era science fiction fantasy series, but it's set in our solar system. So like they go to v in book one, they're in Venus and they're fighting like these Venusian slugs. So it's a bit pulpy, but it's, all, it's also quite grissy at the same time. I mean, I really liked it. Like I enjoyed writing it. Anyway, I had a much more <laughs> typical experience of self-publishing with this book, which is that basically nobody bought it. <laughs> um, like not as, I think I got like five downloads or something. And I was like, you know what? This used to be just about the writing and, you know, the hobby and, and, the, and the enjoyment of that. But that was a lot of time and effort. That was a year. It takes me about a year, to, especially when I was working full time. It takes me about yeah. a year to write a book. That was a year of my life and for no one to buy that book at all or again you know that was kind of a little bit disheartening. so i was like you know what i'm, I'm gonna sack off the self-publishing gig for now like i've done that you know i've done my self-publishing i've always wanted to be traditionally published so i'm gonna kind of you know that's i'm gonna realign my goal and that's gonna be my goal and i and that's when i you know i wrote the justice of kings after that and um you know as I say, it started live as a short story and i trying to shop it to some short story publishers and they all said no um and so then i thought well, yeah well i'll just I'll turn it into a novel and see what happens and um and yeah the result is is not far off what you know what you've got on your shelf behind you um and so so yeah that was yeah that was that was a journey and then you know I got, my <laughs> my journey from that to kind of traditional publication is unfortunately not a particularly inspiring one because I, um, I, you know, you, you will see people, you know, writers and they're like, oh, you know, I've got like a hundred queries out of a hundred rejections and you know, I've been querying for years and blah, 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 blah. And my heart, you know, my heart goes down to those people. I, I fully expected that to be my journey as well. And then, you know, I, I sent it to kind of like three agents. Um, I nearly self-published it. You know, I, I nearly, I nearly just chucked it out on there. My, I had a friend and he was like, look, you don't do that. You know, you've got, you can always self-publish it. That will always be an option. Right. Um, but this one's good. You should try it. I sent it to a couple of agents. I never heard back from one. One of them said no. And then the third one, Harry, it was like, yeah, I really like it. Like, I'll represent you. Um, and that was kind of it. And then so then I got an agent. And then he was like, we did a bit of tweaking. And he was like, right, I'm going to send it to the, you know, the five, the big publishers, you know, the, your Orbit, your Galanx, your, you know, your Door, Tor. And I always forget the fifth, but there is one. Um, like Ace? Or did you say, did you say Daw or Ace? I said Door, D-A-W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Door, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Door. Mm -hmm. And then I think Tor, T O R, mm -hmm. no, Tor.com now, I think. Um, Orbit, Galanx, Galanx and Orbit are all owned by the same company. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm drawing um, a blank too. I don't know why. Why does this happen? There's another one. <laughs> God damn it! Uh, oh, half a Voyager. It's half a Voyager. There you go. Half a Voyager. There it is. Um, <laughs> anyway, you're like, well, don't you 17. just love that? Where you just like, I've got all five, and then fifth all one five, just, and here's four. Just falls um, away. Golly. It sent it out to those, and you know, and four bit were like. We want it, you know. We want this. How much do you want for it? Um, and they and they preempted it like really quickly. Um, like, I and... want all, all the money, please. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a, a million dollars, please. And they were like, "Don't be absurd." Um, baby, it was... don't be absurd. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It ended. It did end up being a sizable sum, actually. Um, and uh, you know, I was extremely lucky in that regard. And they obviously. It, it, with these things it's 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 more a measure of the commerciality of the novel rather than its intrinsic quality like i think it's a good book don't get me wrong but it's it's a it's more about because you know you can read a book which is just blows it's a fantastic it blows your mind but it's if it's a little bit esoteric or it's a bit niche or you know it's um you know it's the, the quality of the prose is, is very good and literary but it doesn't have that mass market appeal then you know that's it's not going to get the huge advance whereas you know i think mine had the, that mass what orbit considered to be the mass market appeal so they obviously paid a lot of money for it but the it's not to say it's the best book in christendom obviously it isn't um but um anyway so there it is so they so as i say it was very quick from getting the agent to getting the offer it was you know it was a it was a straight shot there was very little friction there so as i say not a, a wonderful for me you know the culmination of you know 20 odd years of you know writing as a hobby and as I say, like something I always wanted to do it was a goal very early on. Um, you know, when I was in my young teens, I, I was I was desperately hungry for it. You know, when I was in my teens, and I, funnily enough, I sent a book off to Orbit then as well, and they obviously just rejected it out of hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just like yeah, no thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so so you know, it, it's it was a, it was a very smooth kind of. Yes, yes, it was yes all the way, basically. Um, so I just yeah, obviously and and again, like the stars kind of aligned. You know, it was it was a book that was quite zeitgeisty. It you know it had kind of the Witcher vibes, and the Witcher had was doing very well on like, television and you know you know successful novels and the game and things. So I it it landed in the right place at the right time as well. I think they all bit thought, oh, you know, we can work with this. So that was you know that's and that's basically it. Yeah, that's you know, my writing journey and and um and my you know hope what is hopefully the beginning of a you're, like, you're right off into the sunset <laughs> yeah that's it you know got my so book, guys got it. one book see ya. i'm done peace <laughs> out uh yeah so and some people will be like that you know i mean i i said to myself early early on in life when i was when i started writing i was like my my goal is to get what is to get a book published like and that is that and that was the goal and you know the, the dream was to be a writer as a job um but you know the goal was just to have something out there in print because once it's out there in print it's out there forever mm -hmm. you know and and the idea that you know in 60 years time someone's going to kind of be thumbing through a kind of obsolete kind of thrift bookshop secondhand bookshop and they'll pick up this dusty copy of you know the just the justice of kings and you know it's it's always going to be there and, and i think you know my goal was to add to the, the kind of the pantheon of writers, you know, I mean, this sounds a bit dramatic, but you, you're more, you become immortalized in print, don't you? Once you've done it, you've done it. It's you can't unpublish someone like it's out there forever. And and so I, I think I wanted to have that, you know, legacy and then that as a as a life goal and ambition was to kind of you know get that traditionally published novel. So I'm obviously mega pleased that it happened well they bought three books so i'll have three books now out of publication but, um, <laughs> they can blow the dust off of all three <laughs> exactly yeah we've got the other two of these i'm oh, sorry no we don't actually got to got to pull a book elon go across the states and this that's like, exactly like, yeah yeah <laughs> there's probably there'll probably be some kind of like horrible mess of us you know bookshop that you can just plug into at that point and you know read an all i know right yeah. Who, who, yeah, knows? who knows? <laughs> who knows? Who knows where books are going this, these days? Um, well, I love I love how you've already pr pretty much considered yourself an old soul by calling you know back on the internet. <laughs> back on the it's funny though because you know when I was we I mean we're probably not that far apart in age. I'm like thirty two, so thirty one. Yeah, yeah. So it's I it's funny to me. I mean I can remember when like 
the 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 the, 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 the mobile phone, the Nokia 3210, kind of came out in my mid-teens, and that was like the next big thing. And you know, now we have you know smartphones. Mm-hmm. You know, 20 years late, less than 20 years later. I mean, as as a as a the, the rate of technological progression just in the last 20 years is mind blowing. And in fact, the phone is a perfect example of, of right. how quickly it's progressed. Yeah. But you know, the internet when you and I were, you know, in our, you know, late single figures, kind of early, early teens, it was, it was rubbish. It was nothing to do on it. You know, there was, yeah. you got coffee games, arcade or whatever. But there was no Twitter. There was no Instagram. There was, thank Solitaire God. Solitaire and uh, yeah. Sweep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, MSN Messenger on the weekends with your friends. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, the, yeah. Download the download the old AOL and get you get you yeah. a, a cool sounding screen name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wait for that mail. door to open and shut when your friends go online. <laughs> Rand McNally's World Atlas, and Carter Encyclopedia. I mean, you know, do you, oh and so gosh. when I submitted my first novel to Orbit, it was in hard copy. It was like a printed off manuscript, and that was only like fifteen or sixteen years ago. Right. Um. But, you know, which is which is nuts. So, you know, it is funny how quickly it, it's things have, have progressed. The I, I mean, I've got two young children, and the idea that um, you know, two young boys, um, and the idea that they will grow up in a world of like high definition, on demand, like internet streaming video, for example, where as I grew up with, like, I I can distinctly remember my parents one day we sat down. You know, Sky is in like the satellite TV. Um, I don't know if that's a thing in America, but it, it was well, something weekend. similar, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. And so we sat, we sat down one weekend, I was about 12 or 13, and my mum and dad said, right, um, this weekend we are going to either buy Sky or the internet. Um, you know, we, which one would you prefer? I mean, we're like <laughs> Sky, obviously. <laughs> and, you know, so it's, it's just a remark. And now it's, you can't live without it. You know, yeah. everything is you know, the internet. So it's just it's funny how quickly that has happened that wasn't something that you know was in like the 90s or the 80s that was only that was only like 15 years ago or so yeah yeah it's like i remember growing up and uh you know my dad and i would flip through the tv guide to find mm. out what was coming on that week yeah yeah exactly. just like newspaper. Knowing, and yeah. uh you know and having to like set recording on the vcr and like mm. making sure that like if it was like a game or something you had to yeah. you had to add your extra time or you'd miss it that's it yeah uh, yeah because or, you couldn't just go rewatch it on the internet <laughs> no or by putting the video in and like you know record the re- i used to record futurama onto like vhs mm. <laughs> you know that was back when futurama was make good. sure make sure you didn't rewind it all the way so you didn't record over it because you wanted to keep exactly. your favorite episodes <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's, that's it oh, kids have it so a- dang easy these days <laughs> What a time to be alive. I know. Oh gosh. Oh, yeah. See, I've got a I've got a 20-month-old daughter, so I just can't mm. imagine like you know, she's already, you know, already all about you know Disney mm. Plus on demand. Like she can just yeah, click honestly. a button and boom, yeah. there's all of her favorite stuff. It's... There it is. Yeah. I the other day <sighs> I was I was I was reading um I read Andy Weir's the uh Hail Project Hail Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, I had the hardback and I was flipped over to the front cover. I was just like looking at the front cover of the book not not an ebook like the actual book and i literally just like tried to pinch zoom the front of the and i was like wait a second what, <laughs> what the hell am i doing <laughs> you know, it was just it's complete kind of cognitive dissonance over it yeah and you know and so the idea of you know my my son my eldest son he has you know an ipad and he's got like peter abbott games on there and he can do that and it's quite frightening in some ways you know the, the the i but i think you know to, to, to resist it is to swim against the current you know you've, you've got to accept it and, and roll with the times you know people mm-hmm. were people have been complaining about you know kids these days you know for time immemorial so i think the important thing is not to view technology as a and as an intrinsically bad thing because it isn't of course um it's you know it's all about how you use it right um so anyway there you go that's children technology <laughs> didn't think you'd have that on your bingo card did you I mean, I'm already calling bingo, so <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Um, ding, ding. So, talk a little bit about your writing process. I mean, I know I'm sure it's changed since mm. you know you were that 12, 13 year old writing your your first trilogy, where you could just fall asleep in the middle of a jungle and be fine. Um, <laughs> uh, up up until now, like how how has it changed? How have you found that you've progressed? Or what? I guess what like gets your I guess writer juices flowing. Sure. Uh, you know, do you, do you have a word count per day? Do you try mm. to hit a certain thing per week? Mm-hmm. I when I first started, I mean, when I was younger and I was first started writing, I was, I found everything so, like I found myself so my 
you know, so turbocharged with enthusiasm for everything. Because you know when you're kind of younger and you're your teens and everything is new. So you know, you'd watch Attack of the Clones. I love, I love Attack of the Clones. I've got a real soft spot for the prequel trilogy. And I watched Attack of the Clones in cinema and my mind was blown away by it. I thought, this, is a, this is the best movie of all time. Um, and obviously history has judged it uh, differently. But... Right. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, and, and everything is new. You know, I remember I remember reading like The Last Hero, you know, the Terry Pratchett, it's a Discworld novel. And but I had the, you know, the, the picture, the illustrated version of it. And, and, and just things like that. And it would really kind of inspire you in like a very kind of visceral, direct way. And I found as I've got older, like recapturing that has, has been basically impossible. I think, you know, once you're once you're past a certain age and you you become very genre savvy and you know, you know all of the tropes, you know how it all goes and you know, you're very well read, you're very well, you know, you've watched all the TV and film and everything. It's difficult to get sort of properly, truly excited about, about things anymore, I find, which sounds awful, but it's true. The one thing I am really excited about, by the way, is the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, though. Yeah. Like, I am absolutely desperate for that. Because um, <laughs> The Mandalorian was okay, and I think Boba Fett does nothing for me at all. Mm. Um, but Obi-Wan, that is that is my childhood. They, they're now they're doing the fan service for, for Richard Swan, finally. Um, <laughs> the one and my <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah, yeah. You should read my sci-fi self-published trilogy novel. Um, but the, the I um so my my writing process itself. When I first did that that novel I told you about Mindscape when I was in my late teens, and that that was kind of the blueprint for everything going forward. Mm-hmm. I found I used to plan much more meticulously. So with that, and especially with the multiple kind of POV, because I like to write. I used to like. I mean, The Justice of Kings is is a complex novel in terms of like the the plot and the kind of the broader universe but the actual kind of the narrative structure is very simple it's just a you know chronological single point of view you know but I used to write very complex intertwining you know novels and things and I I love that kind of you know, structure um and so I used to have to plot a bit more meticulously and and what I have found now is in terms of my planning process is it's it's become a little bit more fluid so I tend to have a an outline and I, I certainly have a kind of a chapter outline you know, okay, this chapter, I'm going to write, you know, 130, 140,000 word novel. That's going to be about 30 chapters. Each chapter is going to be about 5,000 words. You know, don't do the maths on that. But the, um, so it's, you know, it's, that's the kind of structure I'm shooting for. Um, uh-huh. I know what has, to, and, and I've become a bit more interested in the, I guess, like the, the actual nuts and bolts of, of the writing process. So, you know, I, I, certain things happen, you know, certain, certain story beats have to happen at certain times. So, you know, for the narrative to kind of be engaging, okay, well, I know that I have to have like a, an explosive action ending, that's going to be about 10, 20,000 words. So what kind of do I need to do to signpost that, you know, what point in the in a narrative do I need to have like another a burst of action, you know, it's a, lots of dramatic irony and kind of Chekhov's gun and things and, you know, foreshadowing. And, and so I, I approach the, I guess, the writing process a, a little bit with a, li- a little bit more intellectual kind of rigor these days, thinking about the actual structure of it. Um, but having said all of that, I also then just tend to just leave a fair bit up to how I feel on the day, because you know often you you know you don't if you don't give yourself enough wiggle room, the writing process can become quite tedious. I think so. You know if you know exactly where you're going at every stage, step of the way, it kind of robs you of that that creative freedom. So. I don't like to. I I don't know what I don't. I have an idea of how the trilogy will end, but I I haven't got it planned. So mm. I know I know I, I have some things that I know I want to happen, which will tie off some storylines. But the precise, I'm going to wait to see when I get there how book three has unfolded as to the the natural concluding points. And I, you know I know whether I want it to be a happy ending or a kind of horribly bleak ending, for example. And I know who's going to live and who's going to die. I know there's kind of key things, but the actual state of, of play at the very end, I like to kind of l- let myself kind of broach that when I come to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I always do that with all my books. You know, I never plan the endings like in great detail. Um, and so, you know, that, that's kind of, I think my writing process is like mat- matured now. It, it, it won't change from how I have it at, as it is at the moment. Certainly not for fantasy and sort of sci-fi novels. And, you know, in terms of my, you know, I got, the actual writing you know process i sit down i've got three i have three days a week where my boys are in daycare at the moment which is wednesday wednesday to friday so you know they're away all day um i just sit down on my desk and i i'll start at um about 8 8 30 in the morning and i'll just i'll go till about lunchtime so about you know 
to 12, one o'clock. And at, at that point, that's kind of it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm creatively depleted by that point. And, you know, if I've done about between one or 2000 words, you know, at that stage, you know, that, that, that'll be a successful session. Mm-hmm. Um, 1000 is maybe a little bit on the, on the low end, like 1500 to 2000 is, is kind of like, but I, but I, these days I kind of shoot for a weekly word count because, um, you know, so I, I try, if I do 5,000 words like a week, which is, you know, it's just very doable, but um, it means, okay, if I do that, I know I'm going to finish a book in, you know, three or four months or whatever it is. And mm-hmm. it, it, then it allows me to enable, you know, if I don't do like the full 2,000 or 1,000 in a session, but if I do like an hour on my Monday, for example, it all counts to kind of the, the weekly total. So I've become a, but I do keep a spreadsheet of my kind of progress and things. So, you know, I, I don't think I do anything particularly different from you know every other writer I suspect most people have um well you know when I was working full-time as a lawyer then um obviously I couldn't do that so I had to just squeeze in whenever I could but um these days you know I've got a bit more time and hopefully no plans to go back to the law anytime soon um my wife is you know very much the corporate breadwinner now and I there just, you go. Kind of, <laughs> just kind of sit at my desk tapping away and building my lego sets and she's probably thinking <laughs> fuck did i marry <laughs> you're always like, how's your husband doing he's freaking at home on the computer <laughs> yeah that's it he's just riding away and the thing is though but and i said to her i said to her this i was like you know it's still a job right? i'm i'm still being you know i'm being paid for it. i've got paid the other day you know because um you know i get paid in installments so there's a whole advance, but then obviously it gets split up. So you get like a big chunk of money in the beginning, but then the rest of it gets split up over the, the book. So you get a chunk of money for turning in a book, a manuscript. I get a chunk of money for the, the first publication of a book. And then I get another chunk of money for the first paperback publication of the book. So I get three kind of sums per book. So it is like basically being a salaried over the course of kind of three years. Um, and uh, so occasionally I have to kind of remind my wife, say, yeah, but I am, but you know, I'm not just because when we first moved to Sydney, I didn't. I, we we moved here for a year, and I was looking for work as a lawyer, as a litigator. Um, but but otherwise, I was just doing nothing. I was just at home all day, and uh, and I was just kind of I was just like writing. But like I didn't have a contract or anything. I was just kind of writing because that was my hobby. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to kind of break her out of that. My like, now I do have money coming in. Now it's okay. You know, <laughs> like I am supporting the family. Um, but, you know, I get paid in England and it just goes to the mortgage. Um, we, yeah, have a house yeah. the, we have a house in London. So it's not like, you know, that kind of, it's a, but it's, there's a, it's, it's just a funny situation. And, and Sophie's always done, you know, very well in terms of, you know, her work and her income. So, you know, she's always been kind of like a few steps ahead of me anyway. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of our natural dynamic. And it does mean I get to spend time with my boys on Mondays and Tuesdays, which is lovely. Um, yeah. But yeah, so you know, I'm trying to fingers crossed, you know, this, these books continue to do well. I don't, I'm, I haven't got a huge hope of seeing any royalties because my advance was fairly sizable. So I got to, I'm going to have to sell a hell of a lot of these things to, to still see any royalties, but, um, but, you know, as long as I can keep, you know, just churning out the trilogies um, for the next 10 or 20 years, then I think I'll be happy. There you go. There you go. Um, so, uh, so speaking of uh, Justice of Kings, can you um, give those who are, I guess, anticipating the novel uh, a little bit about what they can expect from the first installment? Yeah, I, th- I think, um, you know, the, the, the Justice of Kings has at its heart, I think, a sort of a, your classic moral quandary of, of moral absolutism versus moral relativism. So I think, you know, in recent media, we've seen a lot of, you know, heroes who... Um, like Captain America, for example, who, you know, we won't kill anybody under any circumstances because it's ethically incorrect to do so. Um, and so Captain America, we would call a, a deontologist. If, if you were a, if you were up to date on your, um, on your jurisprudence, on your kind of your philosophy of law, which I know, I know that you are, David. Um, I, don't, oh, yeah. I don't need to tell you that. I need to tell you every morning. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, brother. Um, but I, uh, you know, and that is that, that's the idea that certain things are intrinsically wrong. You know, that's the ethical standpoint. That's uh, so killing. You know, it's any circumstances is a, is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's kind of morally inexcusable. Whereas your consequentialist would say, well, you know, the death of one person may be the better of you know, the two outcomes. Even if I kill someone, but it means that ten thousand people get to live, that's the right thing to have done. And that's the kind of and it's at the book's core. There's this theme, right? It, it's it's the idea of and and the law is is predicated on kind of social like common values if you think about the philosophy of law then 
there's like the idea of natural justice, which is you know, certain things are intrinsically good or bad, but then there's kind of like man-made justice and the law kind of like sits somewhere between those two. I mean, I'm not going to turn this into a lecture, but there's... <laughs> and so I was always really interested. Notes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> boring. Um, but I was, I, I remember just being quite frustrated. I don't know, it's an, it's an odd, isn't it? Because I think if you think about, I've used this example a couple of times over the last few days, but if you think about when Mace Windu, remember in the Revenge of the Sith, right? When Mace Windu is going to kill Chancellor Palpatine um, and Chancellor Palpatine is ostensibly unarmed. We know he's a Sith Lord, but we don't know he has the lightning powers. And he's sitting there on the floor in his chambers and he's begging for mercy. And Mace Windu says something like, oh, he's too dangerous to be left alive. And he's, and he's going to kill him. And then Anakin obviously stops him from doing that. But, it, you know, there's, there's two schools of thought that come out of that, right? There's one which is Mace Windu can't kill him because there's been no due process, right? So, you know, that would be an extrajudicial killing, which we call murder. Um, or um, there's the other th- train of school of thought, which is, well, he's, Mace Windu is obviously and intrinsically evil, um, and he is going to make the galaxy a very miserable place. I mean, he's actively plotting to overthrow the Republic. So, you know, if we, if we just kill him, what's, you know, that is clearly the right thing the, the right thing to do from a consequentialist mm-hmm. perspective and I was always I agonized over this as a child um, or as a, as a teenager because you I think you always wonder what you would do in that situation like if you were presented with a similar, similar set of options you know I think we all like to think that we would take the high road or you know we're quite high-minded or we wouldn't you know kill someone we would do but you know you just you never know and, and i think you know as you watch tv and you think oh for god's sake just you know kill him he's obviously evil you know kill thanos you know to airstrike him or something why are we even doing this you know and <laughs> <laughs> just get a sniper rifle and blow him away and um and it's you know i want with the justice of kings right von vault is the main character he's the main character but it's not told by him it's told by his clerk so she's an old woman now and she's looking back on the, on the events of the rise and fall of the Soviet Empire. So the Soviet Empire is this empire. We know it collapses because we're told that in the first paragraph of the first book. And we know that von Vault, who is this justice, he is a, a, a man who is charged with ultimate authority to enforce the law in the empire. We know that he is intrinsically linked to its collapse. And so it's, it's, and she is, so it's kind of like a biography in some ways of his life. Um, but it's you know the first book is is it as at its core a murder mystery, um, with some kind of broader events going on in the background. So there's kind of like this power struggle in Sova, which is the capital of the empire, between the Neiman Church, which is the kind of the, the state church of the empire, which used to have all of these magical powers, but then they were taken away and they were given to the magistratum, which is the legal enforcement, the secular legal enforcement, the, ju- the judiciary essentially. If you think about your different parts of a state you've got your legislative and your executive and your, your judiciary and so it's it, in some kind of like separation of powers move they had all their magical powers taken away they were given to the magistratum and the magistratum gave them the, the justices the justices go around the empire and they enforce the law and if they can't do it just by regular legal process then they have a couple of magical powers they can use as well which is the idea but the magistratum is kind of on the wane so you know the empire is modernizing we are seeing like yeah as the Soviet empire kind of solidifies its grip on all these countries it's kind of like right you all have to build courthouses now and the physical institutions of the state are being kind of put in these places and so the idea of roving justices is becoming a bit obsolete so von Volt is kind of like He's not really been back to the capital. He's kind of consigned to the hinterlands and he does all his, his thing there. And so, you know, book two, he has to go to, back to the capital for various reasons. But it's really about, <laughs> this is a very long answer. <laughs> it's really about, <laughs> it's about, it's a, it's a question of justice ultimately, which you may have guessed from the title, but it's like, you know, what is justice? Is it, is it what the law dictates is, is the right thing to do? Because you, you can have an unjust outcome, you know, even if it, from a jury trial, if someone is acquitted, but it's, it's clearly the wrong thing to have happened. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how can you turn the administration of justice into a, into a process that achieves just outcomes? And what do you do 
especially as someone who has the ultimate authority to interpret and apply the law, what do you do when, the, the, when you consider the right outcome hasn't been reached? And that's the kind of, at its core, Von Bolt's character arc. And, you know, I can't tell you much about that without spoiling the novel, but mm-hmm. it's, you know, he, he, he certainly starts the novel as a paragon, or certainly Helena perceives him to be a paragon, a bit of a stickler, you know, a bit fussy and a bit kind of, you know, this is a law and blah, 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 blah. Um, But as time goes on, he kind of, there's a little bit of a fall from grace. Um, and so it's, it's, it's as much a character study as anything else. And I think this is the first book where I have really, really like drilled down into the kind of the characters and, and their motivations and their, what makes them the characters, those characters and how they kind of came to be in that place, and their histories and their personal backgrounds and their interrelationship. So there's some people said it's quite slow. Um, I obviously disagree. Those people are wrong. Um, <laughs> but it's it's a kind of it's this is not your kind of you know I I think it's an interesting book with lots of interesting things. And if you like like you know, dialogue and talks and, and the conflict is mostly dialogue based. I mean there are sort you've read it right. There are sword fights yeah. in it. There's violence. So there's a big battle at the end there is there are those things but it's also it's not it's not about those are things that happen but it isn't about those things it's about it's a slightly different take on fantasy basically and i yeah. i mean you've read god knows how many books you've read but uh, probably a lot more than i have um i don't <laughs> know if it this has been done in the genre certainly in this way before i know there's the great coats but that's a bit more of you know sword fight yeah yeah you've got you know you've got your low fantasy takes like i know uh myself and a few other people have kind of likened it a little bit to like war uh for the rose throne by peter mclean it's you yes. know it, it, it's got magic but it's very it's it's not really you know used a whole lot but it just kind of mm. kind of comes in certain situations um you know it's it's sort of bleak um but yeah you know i and and, and i talked to you a little bit about this when we were uh damn on twitter you know i was saying it, he, that von Bock kind of has a little bit of like a ned stark complex yes that he's yeah, just yeah, exactly. like he's like this this is the way it's supposed to be i don't care yeah. what you say he has to yeah. die etc etc cetera, et cetera. Yeah. um exactly and that. then like as you know that first season progresses you know he just kind of starts going you know Am I supposed? Do I continue to like do the right thing? Because like, yeah, this could mean I'm gonna die, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, he's he's, so, out, he's out of his depth, isn't he? Like, he's yeah. he wants to do the right thing, but then he quickly realizes that there are forces. My, in the Game of Thrones world, Mice is right, you know, and and I think he's yeah. I think the Ned Stark is it's funny because it's it's so obvious to to, to, the, to see the parallels now. But mm-hmm. you were the first person to bring it up, and I had never actually thought about it in those terms. But I now think that it you also helps that, with the cover. You know, it kind of looks yes, looks yeah, all yeah. about like like Sean Bean. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah a bit of a boromir vibe going on there but the uh, <laughs> but i think that's a i think that's a really good comparison and actually that's that's right you know he is a kind of a ned stark kind of character just wants to do the right thing in a world that is becoming increasingly interested in not doing the right thing right um and that's the tragedy of his character i think yeah yeah and you know and we we talked a little bit about um his character in game of thrones during the uh, morally great panel that i had during tv archon and we were talking about okay you know should should he have done the right thing should he have like actually listened to this character that basically would explain to the entire world you know the night king and and the dead are walking again etc and they're like no like he had he had to kill him because that's that's their law that's what they've had instilled for years and years and years it's like and it's not it's not ned starts like spot to say no we need to mm. listen to him kind of thing yeah so it's it just you know i kept thinking about uh justice kings to that just because of because of uh, von Bolt's art throughout that story because yes. like you said he starts out very like by the book we're gonna mm. do it this way and then like things just kind of start slowly twisting a little slipping bit. a little bit exactly yeah, yeah yeah so i'm i'm curious what what made you write this novel from the perspective of helena sadanka uh because you know you know i know a lot of people would go into it going oh it's about von vault it's gonna be from his yeah, perspective yeah. but mm. it's not like it's looking at him from a completely different perspective so what it was it was it always the plan oh yes it was yeah and uh, the idea came from um the idea to frame it in that way came from robert harris's Cicero trilogy and he wrote a, a trilogy of novels about the roman he was a Roman consul. He was a yeah, Roman patrician called Cicero, and he's a very you know famous Roman. And uh, he was started life as a lawyer as well, funny enough. Um, and um, it's written from the perspective of his slave. Um, but you know the Roman slaves aren't the slaves that slaves 
that we think of them as they were more like well looked after secretaries in this instance um and uh so he kind of tiro is is di dictating or narrating the, the events of cicero's life up until his death um and i thought it was just a, a really really good way of of writing the story and i think there's a couple of reasons for that and i think the first one is i'm if you think about real life historical characters uh people like um I don't know, Churchill as an example. I would I would never so creepy because I was literally thinking Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he's gonna say Churchill. <laughs> Ooh, he's gonna say Churchill. Um if you think of Churchill, I would never I would never write a book from Churchill's perspective. Like there's just there's there's too much to take on there. Like, you know, the, he is like yeah, FDR or oh god, Hitler for you. <laughs> I'm mean, on a bit of a World War II thing now, but like, you know, that's a Hitler's a bad example, but like you would never <laughs> To get into like these people who shaped an entire era, you know, uh, of human history, you would never presume to. How would you begin to get inside their heads? How could you kind of do justice to like the thoughts? And and I think if you and if you did, it would only be disappointing. Um, you would never be able to do it justice. You know, if, if you're you, always if it on turned, the outside looking in. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I and I think these people are mythologized as well. And so it's it's. And I think Von Volt is obviously a completely fictional character, but the the idea that in this within the Soviet Empire he is like this historic patrician storied kind of character. He is like a you know a, a, a sort of the elder statesman of the Soviet Empire, and um, and so I didn't I thought to write the story from his perspective and hear his the minutiae of his thoughts and oh and then I killed this guy because and then I lost my shit because I thought the wrong decision had been reached and then I killed him I mean, it'd just be rubbish it, it wouldn't be satisfying to the reader and you lose you lose so much I don't like over I don't like over telling a story or over explaining things so mm. you know I I am of I'm a light touch world builder so you know I've got notes notes of world building but like in the story itself I I might I think it's a much more effective world building tool to like have the characters refer to well known events in world or you know, well known people. I mean, you and I, I'm not going to say, oh, you know, if I said to you, George Bush, you don't, you don't then, then say to me, oh, yes, the 43rd president of the United States, you know, whatever he was. Like, we both know that. So there's no right. need to then just explain to one another who he was. And, you know, so why would you do that in a fantasy world? You know, if I said, oh, yes, the Earl of Brockenhurst, and he said, oh, yes, the Earl of Brockenhurst, I met him, and he's this person. And it's like, well, we know that. So I he's think- He's the child of such and such. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, well, yeah, why are you telling me that? You know? <laughs> and so I, it's it's about a very similar, it's, it's a fine balance, isn't there? Because you've got to convey to the reader a certain amount of information so that they can understand and, and enjoy the world and make sure that it's kind of internally consistent. But you don't want to overburden the reader with like tons of explanation because a they don't need it i think um and some people do some people want to be like spoon-fed and handheld through the novel and everything has to be completely fully explained um i will never do, i'll never do that um so if you that's you, you're that kind of person don't read this book because you'll hate it if that's you um, just, just cut the speed <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> leave now but like i think that it's and dan abnett gave a great example of this and he said when the in an, he did an interview a couple of years ago and he said if you think about the original star wars trilogy in, an, in a new hope when luke skywalker first meets obi-wan kenobi and obi-wan kenobi refers to the clone wars you know which and that was it he was like i you know, i fought with your father in the clone wars you know and that's and, and that's the only reference you ever got to it before they made a whole film out of it mm -hmm. um but that and 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 you know dan abnett was like wow he was like what are the clone wars that sounds so cool you know it's this fleeting reference of that that of course Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, they know what the Clone Wars were, so they don't need to just talk about it. Mm -hmm. And it was that kind of throwaway reference that was just a, an excellent world, you know, the world builder's tool. And so I don't like over explaining things. And, and using Helena as we get to keep Von Vault, the mystique of his character intact, he is supposed to be a, an unreadable man. He's supposed to be this kind of like distant, kind of cold, serious figure. But there's nuance to his character at the same time. You know, he has a, you know, he had a horrible upbringing. His father essentially betrayed their homeland to you know, become a Sovan. He was, Von Volt was pressed into the legions and he killed a bunch of people and all the rest of it. So the, all of these things kind of feed into Von Volt's character. But I think it's much more interesting to see Helena kind of deduce his thoughts and feelings and try and work out 
what, why he's doing what he's doing and how those things affect her as an impartial well, a partial observer um then to have von Vol just explain everything you know because okay great oh, that's why he did it fine you know it would just i don't think it'd be a very satisfying experience for the reader and so you know i think this you're you're right it, people don't know that it's told from helena's perspective and that's you know that's just the way it's been marketed and ultimately von Volt is the main character of, of the trilogy it's just not the story just isn't told by him mm. um and so i just thought it was a more effective way of telling the story and, and yeah. yes it was you know and it was always the plan to do it that way and, and i think it works great i mean it, you know you don't you know there, there you do have the the different povs and certain fantasy novels and so forth but i i think the way it is told i mean you still so you know get enough into von Volt's conscious to, to find out why he's doing the things because like i yeah. said you know the, the character arc is enough to where it's not just like he's not just this linear figure who just does the same thing over and over and over again right the, the end of the novel and then you just have helena over there that's like actually having the arc of her life kind of thing <laughs> um you know you, you're seeing you're seeing a progression from both yeah uh which mm. which really you know works really well so as far as uh the second novel and, and going forward uh mm. i guess what can readers expect uh you know kind of how you you know hit the the sophomore book and then you know the mm. finale i mean i know you said that you kind of have an idea of how you're going to finish things up but you're not mm. quite sure how you're going to get there but yeah yeah um you know i guess more what can people expect from the second book the second book is obviously like as you know the second book is very, is definitely a two towers in the, in the sense that we have a, a broadening of scope um so you know the second book is at least half of the book at the moment i haven't got my edits back yet uh is in sova so we go to sova the capital of the empire it was, there's all sorts of things happening in there so and then we sort of go down to the frontier which is this kind of like lawless area of ground a bit like kind of the, the this is an analog of the middle east in the kind of 11th 12th century so you've got these like templar fortresses there but it's otherwise a largely ungoverned space of land. So, you know, we go to these different places and I think what I wanted to do with, I, a lot of people will only read book one. So I, I knew that book one had to be like relatively, relatively self-contained. Um, and I think when I approach, because I've written a lot of, you know, I, I think the trilogy has become the kind of the standard operating procedure for, you know, sci-fi and fantasy these days. So when I write a trilogy, I think there's got to be a kind of meta story arc that spans all three books, obviously. Um, but it also, you have to have enough closure at the end of each installment for the reader to kind of walk away from that novel uh, having had a satisfying reading experience. And so I think, I mean, hopefully I've achieved that with Justice of Kings. Obviously, the, the murder mystery is resolved at the end of the book, but then we get a sense of a foreboding at wider events, you know, affecting the empire. And so the second book is obviously exploring those events that are wider events affecting the empire. Um, and so we get into the kind of the nuts and bolts of, of that and all the machinations that are going on between these kind of two state bodies and you know, meet the emperor and things like that. Um, so there's a broadening of scope. Um, I also wanted to though, and I think with the justice of, with this series, I thought what what makes the series unique and interesting is the legal investigations aspect of it, the prosecutions. So I wanted to kind of keep that theme running through because otherwise it could just turn into like a fairly generic fantasy novel. So I wanted to have another investigation of of sorts in the second book as well, a kind of a mystery to keep the kind of the readers hooked in. But mm -hmm. we're still much more in the the broader events now as well, and that investigation ties into those. So book two i was very, i was really happy actually at how book two turned out and i don't know what, what my editors are going to say they might hate it actually um but, uh, <laughs> oh my god i know so you know that's i yeah you know, that's that's all done as i say it's with them and then book three book three is a combination of you know tying up all of the the loose ends that you and also having the big the big finale so i know what the big finale is going to be um, I know, you know, I'm, I'm 35,000 words into that draft of book three. So, you know, we're, we're kind of at that stage now where kind of things are really picking up and happening. Um, so it's it becomes a bit, becomes a lot more actually. I think book one is a kind of very, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of more cerebral reading experience. You know, you're, you're kind of in, into this one investigation and the scope is quite narrow and that investigation gets solved and we get the sense of this wider conspiracy happening. But um Book two and three were kind of really kind of just getting into that now, and and pace is picking up, and some people are getting killed left, right, and center. And so there's a bit more action as you as you one would expect. So yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to keep it thematically similar to the first book because I think that's that's the, the core of the story. And of course, we're still very much focused on von Volk's you know developing 
character as well. And there's some, some more horror elements in the second book as well. I think there are a few really nice, quite terrifying parts in that as well. And we get more into the afterlife as well. So, because the magic of the book is this, after, this afterlife aspect, isn't it? It's this kind of, um, you know, we kind of ex explore where that magic comes from, how it came to be in the world, you know, and we, we have a few more journeys into the afterlife as a kind of separate plane of existence as well so and book three there's loads more of that too so we're, we're kind of building more of the magic into it more of the the action more of the, the political and the battles and things so it's it, it's just a you know if if the justice of kings was a was a thin end end of the wedge we're kind of obviously just extrapolating those themes so i think you know if you really enjoyed the justice of kings if you loved like helena and bob Bolt's character dynamics and you know, that kind of investigations, there definitely will be more of that. But we are also, but if you read the Justice of Kings and you're like, what is going on in Sover? I have to know. Mm -hmm. Then you obviously have the answers to that, those questions as well. So um, it's, yeah, it's all of those things and more. <laughs> and more, I like that. <laughs> um, well, everybody that's, uh, that's tuning in, just, uh, so Justice of Kings, it actually comes out next Tuesday, the 22nd. So make sure to go out and grab this amazing, fantasy debut from richard um you, and go check out his self-published trilogy uh that is out on amazon uh, i i picked it up Good as man. soon as i got done reading this so <laughs> I, I'll, I'll definitely be checking it out um richard i'm looking forward to book two and book three thanks man uh I, i'm at cl clearly this has the fan fiatic stamp of approval uh from probably about five or six people already on the blog so gonna say yeah I you're, turning, many... you're turning into this year's john glenn <laughs> <laughs> how many people are your places are reviewing this thing i mean i love them all but it's like how many people you got on your rosters these days 35 <laughs> oh really yeah, okay so we're another 30 reviews to go from yeah, yeah so just just Fantastic. make sure you're just checking your boxes so. that's it yeah perfect <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, best of luck uh, when you get your Thanks, ed eds back. Definitely looking forward to book two. Um, and uh, we'll we'll try to do this again. But I'm looking forward to having you on uh, next year's TBR con since you've uh, Absolutely. you've already signed up. So you, you've already you've already put your your signature in. So that's it. Back out now. So the binding contract. <laughs> exactly. I would know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll uh, we'll talk again soon. And like I said, uh, you know, definitely holler at me if you ever need anything. Great. Thanks, mate. Pleasure chatting.